you can minimize and then it'll stream captioning. It's pretty accurate um, if you would like it. I'll also put the instructions in the chat box. And I'm gonna turn it over to Dave Holpin and thank you all so much for coming. Great, thank you, Callie. I wanna thank Kim University for partnering with the Office of Food Nutrition Security to host this event. Uh, we are sponsored by the UM Foundation Food Nutrition Security Support Fund. And this is the Eco Nutrition Cafe Series for 2021, Home Gardening for Food Security. And this year with the pandemic, we did see unprecedented disruptions to the food system. And so as we were thinking about a theme for this year, home gardening for food security seemed appropriate. I also want to thank uh, the graduate students in our food system course who did uh, design a couple of the handouts, the ones that weren't designed by uh, Ellen Ecker Ogden were designed by uh, students in our PhD program. And <clears throat> I'll just give a very brief uh, overview of how this came about. So in 2019, in the summer, some youth in Calhoun County, and Calhoun County is one of the key community partners for the Office of Food Nutrition Security, they were doing a project and they took pictures and wrote journals about food security in Calhoun County. And what the 7th through 12th graders came to the conclusion was that home gardening was essential for people in Calhoun County to have adequate food during the summer. And so that was really what precipitated this. Uh, it was the idea from the kids uh, that uh, were in that program. And so we are so fortunate to have an expert, nationally known speaker, Ellen Ecker Ogden, to be with us tonight. And she will be speaking about the new heirloom garden and her newest book is just hot off the press from the beginning of this month. And so I think we'll probably get to see some nice pictures from that book tonight. And uh, she has published six books. And I did not mention last week, but she is from Vermont. And as we were talking this week, I said, Ellen, Mississippi is just like Vermont. We are average. Our last average frost date is just earlier than yours. And so we grow a lot of the same things. So Ellen, take it away. Thank you so much for being here. Oh, well, thank you, David, very much for inviting me. It's a pleasure. Um, so I'm, I'm going to screen share here and then I'll get started. Let's see if this works. I think it does. Amazing. Amazing. Great. Um, well, um, it's such a treat to be here. One of the, um, first of all, I want to say I think the handouts that the students created are fantastic. I, I, I admired them last week when I saw them and I admired them again this week and I, um, I think it's, they're wonderful. And um, I want to say that this is actually part two of the program. Uh, last week, I really focused on design. It was called the art of growing food. And I really wanted to give my six steps to successful design, which um, is, is encompassed in that handout that you ha were given this week. And if you were in the class last week, it's the same handout. But then I also created um, a, a very um, unglamorous worksheet, which is about plant families. And I'm going to get into that at the end of this talk, um, because really what I want to focus on in this um, part two is what to plant. Last week, we talked about how to plant. And this week, we're going to talk about what to plant. But I will still do a little overview of what to design, how to set up the design. And then I'll sort of start talking about why heirlooms are important and what are heirlooms and then uh, share with you the plant families and, and um, why, why it's a different way of thinking about the garden rather than just thinking about individual varieties of what you want to plant but really thinking about varieties within their plant families. So without further ado, I'm just going to start a little bit. For those of you, I didn't want to repeat too much from last week, but I wanted to give you a little background of, of how I happen to be um, here today. Back, way back in the 1980s or so, um, my husband and I moved to Vermont 
And we, um, I had a design business because I just graduated from art school and um, my husband wanted to grow organic vegetables. And I had no interest in gardening or growing vegetables. And so, uh, but I did love to cook. So I decided that if, if he would grow the vegetables, I would be the cook. And it seemed like a wonderful arrangement, um, at least for a little while until his ambitions got got bigger and he didn't want to just grow a small garden he wanted to grow a big garden and he wanted to start um, selling his organic local vegetables to the the restaurants the chefs at the restaurants and um, unfortunately back in 1980 a lot of the chefs had no interest in local organic vegetables at least not in our area I think if we were in California, it would have been different. But in Vermont, they just wanted their iceberg lettuce and their, you know, their standard things that they got from their suppliers. So uh, we were very lucky um, in that we had friends who had gone to Italy and they brought us seeds for a little um, a sa unknown salad green back at the time for anybody who had not gone to Italy called rucola. Uh, we know it now as arugula, but at the time we hadn't really heard of it and we, we sowed the seed and, and miraculously this incredible little green fuzz showed up on the surface and we let it grow for about 10 days and then we tasted it and we thought, mm, this is kind of interesting. And uh, we liked it so much that my husband decided that he wanted to order more arugula from Italy. And so he wrote away for an Italian seed catalog. Well, what he hadn't told me was that a minimum order for uh, rucola uh, except if we were just buying a packet it was a two kilo bag and a minimum order of a hundred kilos so he ordered a lot of seed and so um, we decided that once we had about a hundred kilos of Italian vegetable seeds in our living room that we couldn't do much except start a seed catalog because seeds are not like wine and cheese it, they don't get better with age so we started a catalog called the cook's garden um, and I wrote recipes being the cook and he uh, figured out what to sell in the in the um, catalog and we found there were a lot of other gardeners who really did want to grow something unusual uh, not necessarily Italian vegetables but um, arugula was starting to catch on as was the sweet Genovese basil and my job as the cook was to go out in the garden and taste all of the different salad greens and and different vegetables and come up with recipes to um, put in the seed catalog I learned a lot about um, lettuce. I found that uh, instead of the green leaf and the red leaf lettuce that was in the grocery store, there were actually 150 different kinds of lettuce that we could um, put in our seed catalog, which we did. And my job was to taste and come up with descriptions for the flavor of each one of those different kinds of greens and a lot of chicories. We grew a lot of chicories and I ended up really enjoying chicory. I had to go to Italy at one point and figure out um, how Italians cook chicory, but I, I um, and they don't really cook it. They just add it to wonderful salads and, and enjoy the, the beauty of the vegetable. Um, and then I also ended up going to cooking school in Ireland at the Ballymolo School. And this this is when I really discovered what I call the art of growing food because the, the European potager, the European vegetable gardens are so beautiful that, you know, especially the, the nice ones that were at this particular school. But, but also I noticed that, that everybody who could grow foods often combined food and flowers and, and would grow them in, you know, windowsills and, and anywhere they could find a little patch of land. And then I realized that that gardens didn't have to be great big giant rectangles with long straight rows, but they could be um, lovely little pocket gardens if you could just make them beautiful. So I, um, being an art student, I decided to switch my um, my career over to doing garden designs and and how to develop um, beautiful food gardens primarily because I'm not that interested in flowers, but I do love food. And so in the handout that you that you did receive tonight um, is what I call my six steps to success, which starts with design, um, beds, paths, fences plants um, and comfort I some that I guess the, the wording dropped out of this slide but but to really figure out those areas and I'm just going to do a, an overview of what I taught last week and um, for those of you who were not here last week I'm, I'm sure there's a recording for you um, so the number one thing is to look at your landscape as a whole to to remember that it's connected to everything it's it's connected to your neighbor's property it's connected to the mountains and the streams and the trees and and 
you know, there's just a lot more to our landscapes than we can really see within that, that sort of um, rigid area that we call our backyard. And so remembering that it's all about nature and and, and keeping everything healthy and, and really supporting a whole ecosystem that goes beyond just the food that we grow in the garden. And then once you start looking at your, your property as a whole, start looking at how to design that, that design on paper with graph paper um, and drawing and, and looking at books and just coming up with a, with a sketch that fits into your yard. Um, and that four square design um, that, I, that I feature in a lot of my books and in a lot of my designs is based on an organic four square rotation where you're growing legumes, the peas and the beans in one bed and those will grow into where the roots have been growing because legumes set nitrogen and the roots have been depleting the, the soil of nitrogen. And then the roots will grow in where the fruits and flowers and then the leafy greens. So this is called an organic uh, four square rotation because it's really important to rotate crops every year. When you grow the crops in the same place every year, um, often it, it brings in disease and pests and, and is not as good for the soil. It really depletes the soil. So being able to build the soil and, and keep keep the soil healthy is really important. Uh, an example of a four square garden um, is this little uh, part, another name for it is called a parterre design. And, and oftentimes port parterres have, have nice wide paths that are usually four feet wide. And then auxiliary paths, which are these stepping stones in the, in the beds that are more like two feet wide. And those are important because you don't wanna be stepping all over the garden bed once you get it planted because that will compact the roots and, and make it harder for the plants to grow. Um, and this is what the garden will look like um, later in the season. Um, another important feature when you're designing the garden is, is putting in gates and arbors and, and uh, creating height. And this is a, a particularly good example of, of, a, of a beautifully disguised deer fence as well. You can sort of see how the, the fencing is, is being blocked in. So not only is there a nice gate, but there's no way for the deer to get into here. So you sort of don't really see it because it's also being, you're being distracted by the, the beautiful grape arbor and um, of course, the, the beautiful raised beds and the vegetables as well. Um, and remembering about um, compost and cover crops and building organic soil, how what feeds your plants ultimately feeds you. So it's really important to, to, to pay attention to your soil. And a lot of people put raised beds in because they say, oh, I don't have very good soil. But, but soil is something that you can actually create. You can, you can build your soil by, by adding uh, nutrients to it, not necessarily fertilizers. And if you do use fertilizers, make sure you have organic fertilizer. But, but um, by paying attention, by adding compost and, and well-rotted manure, and of course, cover crops in the summer, in the fall, and in the winter as well. Um, and then creating places for comfort and creating sanctuary. I think it's really important to put a bench in the garden, a place where you can sit and you can relax and, and you can appreciate all your efforts. And so often vegetable gardens, people think of them as work. And I think when you put a bench or a table and chairs to have meals out in your garden, it turns work into play. And that's a really important element of, of garden design. Um, and finally, I love the idea of adding art and whimsy and making gardens fun. And maybe it's something you find in an antique store and you just don't want to bring it into the house or you want to find something. You can build a whole garden theme around it and, and just finding things, maybe they're old old um, stone sculptures from your grandmother's garden, or as we were talking about earlier, a, an old boot that you can turn into a birdhouse. Just having, make, putting art and whimsy in the garden is really fun because it makes you smile. And um, we know that smiling um, makes us feel better. And that's what really gardens are all about, um, is, is providing a sanctuary space where we can, we can that fe will feed us, but will also provide um, a support for body, mind, and, and spirit. And then of course, nature and supporting the environment. We have to do our, our part to, to keep um, the birds and the bees and all the healthy insects, um, you know, thriving. We, you know, there's a lot of 
of uh, wonderful new books about bringing nature home by Doug Tallamy is a is a book that's one of my favorites and he talks about creating habitats um, for uh, birds and and insects to thrive and it really starts in our backyards when we're planting native varieties that really um, support the natural um, environment. But why grow heirlooms? Why, why do we think heirlooms are important? Well, in those wonderful handouts, I know that there were certain things that, um, that were said. Um, number one would be flavor. Um, Roz Creasy, who I interviewed for my my book said, if I don't like the taste, I'm not going to eat it. Um, and, you know, it's really true. We think of heirloom tomatoes, but there's a lot of other types of heirloom vegetables that are, um, that have a lot of flavor. And when we had our seed catalog, one of the things we did was we would, we would invite people to our farm to taste all the different beans and, and um, all, every, uh, taste trial we did the the heirloom beans tasted better than the regular beans and same with some of the tomatoes and and many of the melons and and the peas it, we just found that heirlooms tended to have better flavor um, and then there's all kinds of varieties that that um, we can't buy in the grocery store that we can only grow in our gardens and and that makes them extra special to be growing them in our gardens and and sharing them with friends when they come over and and being able to say with pride that I grew this and um, isn't this beautiful and of course the food that we grow in our own gardens is always going to taste better. Another reason to grow heirlooms is fragrance. The heirloom peonies around my house have no name, says Marilyn Barlow, who owns a seed catalog called Select Seeds, yet they have a fragrance that makes me weak in the knees. Um, and so what, what is an heirloom? Well, oftentimes heirlooms are described as seeds that were, that were, um, that were around before 1950 when, air, when hybrids were developed because hybrids are seeds that have been bred to have a seed that is considered um, um, sterile seed. So it either won't grow at all or it won't grow the same as the parent plant. But an heirloom is also an open pollinated seed, which means that the seed will, um, if you save it, it will more, more than likely come back to be like its parent plant. And there's lots of exceptions, um, especially, we'll, we'll talk about that in the next thing in the gourd family, when, when plants cross pollinated. But more or less, the, the, the heirloom uh, plant is an open pollinated seed or, um, or a flower or a plant. And fragrance is especially evident when you have old roses, wonderful old roses, which I, I'm sure you can grow more old ro roses when, than we can here in Vermont. We have a zone four garden and, and there's only two or three old roses that we can grow. Um, and wonderful old fruits, when you walk through an orchard that's full of peaches and apples and pears and, and raspberries and what a wonderful aroma they, they exude. Another reason to grow heirlooms is the history. Here today, gone tomorrow. Unless we prefer, pre preserve seeds, they will disappear, says Dr. William Roy's Reaver, who um, has his own seed company. Uh, he sells his seeds called Rough 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 Road Seed, I believe they're called. And I interviewed him for my book. And you know, he really believes that it that that we're losing seeds at such a rapid rate and it's very important to preserve them. And he has a wonderful story about um, his father, his grandfather who uh, saved seed and he never really appreciated his grandfather's seed saving until his grandfather passed on and, and he was cleaning out a freezer in the basement and he found many of the old varieties that he had been preserved in the freezer. And one of the things that he learned um, the, the hard way is that when you put seeds in a freezer, it keeps them in preservation for a long time. But once he opened those jars, those seeds were so dry that the moisture quickly um, got into those seeds and they weren't as uh, viable as they would have been if he had um, preserved them in other ways. So that's, that's something for another topic, but remembering when you're saving seeds to really pay attention to how you save them and, and what type of um, conditions you give them beautiful quince and um, I think this is a gooseberry or something. Um, I'm not exactly sure, but but heirloom fruits are so beautiful. Um, I know they look a little gnarled. They might not be something that you would buy in the grocery store, but I do think that a, a quince is one of the more unusual and, and um, wonderful old fruits. 
Another reason to save seeds and to, to um, preserve heirlooms is to share the knowledge. One of, the, the, um, one of my favorite heirloom seed breeders is Frank Morton, who owns a seed catalog called Wild Garden Seeds. And um, he uh, educates and encourages farmers and gardeners to become seed savers and growers. And, and one of the things I learned um, was that he really wanted, he, he spent a couple of years traveling around the country teaching young farmers how to save their own seeds. So number one, they didn't have to buy seeds every year and it saved money, but also because then they would grow enough seed to be able to share them with, with other people. And, and I'm, I'm discovering lots and lots of smaller seed companies um, that are alternatives to the big seed companies that so many of us tend to, to use like Burpee and um, well, I don't want to name any names, but I do have a, a list of, of smaller seed suppliers in, the, in a slide coming up. Um, and another reason is genetic diversity, is the hedge between us and global famine, says Will Bonsell of the Scatter Seed Project. And, and he told me that 94% of vegetable seed was lost during the 20th century, which, which is a shocking amount. Um, he has a wonderful um, uh, movie, I'm trying to think of what it's called, but if you, if you write his name down, um, you'll be able to find the movie that, um, where he does talk about seed saving and, and shares his, his politics around seeds. So what are seeds? Well, seeds are, are things we eat. You know, look at this beautiful pea seed. I know I was just chatting with Dave and he was saying the peas grew about a foot today because you had such a warm weather. Well, you know, those peas were still going to be um, shucking them and eating them soon. But if you left a few of the seed pods on the vine and, and they would dry up, they would turn into seeds that you could plant again for another year. But so often seed catalogs have, have really convinced us that we need to buy seeds every year. And, and um, I love the quotes and I love these old seed, seed catalog covers, for instance, but I also love the quotes that Burpee writes on her, the plain truth about seeds that grow. Um, and, and their burpees matchless tomato. And of course, back in 1914, there was no such thing as an heirloom tomato, but um, heirlooms uh, were, were are really a, a fairly recent term that we use for, for tomatoes. But I do love um, the old seed catalogs and, and how exciting they must have been to come in the mail after a long, cold winter. But so often, um, um, we forget that we can save our own seeds. And, and the beautiful thing about saving seeds is you can share seeds with your friends. I often grow enough seeds that I pack up seeds for, for Christmas presents um, and send them out. Um, and so there's, there's, there's a lot of different ways to, to, to um, save your seeds. And at the end of this lecture, I'll show you three of my, of my favorite books about how to save seeds. But here's a, a small snippet of alternative seed suppliers. I, this is from my book um, and I just posted a, um, a on my blog today about um, seed suppliers with some lists and some links and some of these are um, our southern seed companies like So True Seed is a wonderful southern seed company and southern seed exposure exchange and um, Siskiyou Seeds, uh, Sustainable Seeds, True Love Seeds is another one and um, so you know make a note of, of some of these seed suppliers and and maybe you could branch out if you haven't already ordered your seeds for this year but branch out and maybe um, try growing some unusual heirlooms um, that have been um, grown by some of these or organic open pollinated um, family owned businesses. So now to get into heirlooms and plant families and, and um, this is a, going to be an area that um, may be new to you but one of the things that is really important if you do want to become a seed saver is learning about plant families because all of the plants that you're growing in your garden um, will do well but if if, you starting, if you're starting to understand how plants grow, you'll know which plants you can save the seed easily and which plants you can't. Um, sometimes seeds take two years to develop if it's a biennial plant. And uh, learning plant families is also good when you're cooking because if you are trying to cook something with carrots, for instance, it's in the, the um, umbelliferae family, which is similar to celery. And, and you'll know that those families are interchangeable when you're, when you're preparing food. So, um, 
um, using that little handout that I sent that I that I um, included, um, I just thought it might be fun to to sort of roll through some of these uh, families. And I'm I'm hoping that at the end of this, um, we can all share some of our favorites because one of the things I I told Dave is that you know so often with heirloom varieties that they really started off regionally. So what I can grow here in Vermont is going to be very different than what you can grow in the South. And I feel as gardeners, not only can we learn from each other but we can also share some of these um, wonderful stories about seeds. Maybe some of you have family seeds that you've passed down. Um, and so I'm, I'm hoping that we can have a little sort of discussion about what you grow and, and what you love. So the amaranth family is amaranth and beets and chard, auric, lamb's quarters, which we can often think of it as a weed, um, quinoa and spinach. And um, some of the varieties within those families, these are from my book, um, the Hopi red dye is an endangered um, amaranth and it's one that was used for by the uh, Hope, I, I wrote hope, it's actually Hopi red dye, um, by the Native Americans to, for, for, for dyeing, but also for, uh, amaranth is a, is a very, um, you know, essential grain um, that is highly nutritional and it's a beautiful, beautiful plant. Um, and amaranth is something that we grow in our garden. I, you've probably grown that amaranth called Love Lies Bleeding. Um, and I have a wonderful one called Kiss Me Over the Garden Gate, which I just adore. Um, and then beets, some of the old heirloom beets would be Bull's Blood or McGregor's Beet, which is grown just for the, the, the green tops and the Lutz Green, it's a big winter keeper beet um, because maybe some of you have root cellars and I know for a number of years we had a root cellar and we would grow summer beets and we would grow winter boot beets and um, the early blood turnip and the chioga which is that candy striped beet and the Detroit dark red is a, a wonderful uh, nutritious, highly nutritious dark red beet. And then chard, I bet many of you grow chard, the perpetual spinach or the sea kale or the five color silver beet, which is an old heirloom variety that has been found in catalogs back in the 1700s and, and the Ford hook giant, which was developed by, um, by Burpee, which um, was, is on the Ford hook farm. And there are a lot of older varieties that, that have that name Ford hook because those were, were very early varieties that are still um, just as good as they were back in the, in the 1700s as they are now. And same with Bloomsdale spinach. Bloomsdale spinach is a variety that was developed by the Landreth Seed Company, which was an earliest, one of the earliest seed catalogs. And Bloomsdale spinach is, is still one of the my favorites for early spring spinach and late fall spinach and and Amsterdam prickly seeded is an early variety that I that I saw at, at Colonial Williamsburg the one that they would sow and and Mal Malabar which is a actually I don't I meant to look this up but I don't know if it's actually a spinach um, but we call it Malabar spinach and it's a wonderful vining spinach that grows really well in the heat um, an example of ruby chard one of my um you know that's a wonderful cut and come again so i call it the workhorse of the garden because once you start cutting the the chard it will just keep growing to be bigger and bigger and stronger um, and a beautiful harvest of beets there's nothing more beautiful than than that first that exciting um, harvest of beets from the season. And then there's so many ways to prepare beets using the beet greens and the beet roots and roasted beets and in salads or in soups. And um, I think they're one of the most versatile vegetables we have. And then there's the cabbage family, that arugula and the broccoli and the Brussels sprouts and cabbage and kohlrabi and radish and turnip and nasturtium. Did you know all of those were all in the same family? Um, you know, it's called the cruc crucifera family. Um, I'm teaching you a little Latin as we go along and um, cabbage is, is known for its um, spiciness but also its health benefits um, and um, it really benefits in in the growing season from lots of organic fertilizer and side dressing of compost and and um, plenty of water. 
Um, and some of my favorite varieties, heirloom varieties that I have in some of the designs in my book would be arugula, the sylvetica, which is the tiny leafed um, arugula, um, and the Romanesco broccoli, which is that lovely kind of cone shaped broccoli, and the rapini, which is more of a leafy um, broccoli with, with a little bit of a, of a bud and lots of wonderful leaves, and, and cabbages. I'm not sure how many of these cabbages you've tried. The early Jersey Wakefield is an old um, tried and true variety of, of cabbage and the filderkraut is a pointed cabbage which is what they actually grow in um, a lot in Germany to make the most delicious sauerkraut. Um, and cauliflower, uh, the purple of Sicily and the purple cape, I, I just love these names. Um, collards, Vates, Georgia, Southern Creole, I bet all of you grow collards. I love collards. I, I usually grow um, the Vates, which is a, a wide leaf variety. Variety. And then the kale, the Russian, the red Russian, and the Siberian, and the, the um, lacinato, also known as the blue Cus Tuscan kale, is a gorgeous ornamental kale. Kohlrabi, radishes, I bet you're already harvesting your radishes, the China rose, the 18 day, the French breakfast radish. Now, all of these families in the cabbage family, they don't, uh, except with the exception of arugula, it's very hard to let it, you, you don't usually get um, seed in that first year. Usually these are biennial crops that will set seed in the second year. Um, just a gorgeous head of cabbage, um, a, a photograph from my book. And I, I just love putting this here just as a reminder of how beautiful food can be. And, and when I grow a cabbage that looks this, this beautiful, I must admit it's, it's very hard to actually harvest it. I'd rather I just left it in the ground to admire in it. But cabbage especially, I just love the way it grows by the way it folds its leaves over the tops. And the carrot family, the umbelliferae, um, is the anise and caraway and carrot and celery and celeriac and dill and cilantro and parsley and parsnip. And then all of these are a group of root vegetables that, that um, will form a flower head that will then form into seed. And they can grow in the first year or sometimes the second year. And, and generally they're very aromatic. Um, and the tiny flowers make a wonderful nectar for ladybugs and, and parasites parasitic wasps and the black swallowtail butterfly. And so often it's good to leave uh, at least a few of these plants to go to seed in the garden just um, to create a wonderful habitat for the, 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 um, the pollinators. Um, some of the heirloom cultivars in the ca carrot family would be the, the Touchon and the Scarlet Nante and they have wonderful flavor. The Chantenay Red Core, the Danvers Half Long, Cosmic Purple, um, um, which resembles really the earliest carrot varieties, which were purple, and then they were eventually bred to be yellow and orange and sometimes white. Celery root, um, leafy fennel, fennel, uh, finocchio, there's a difference between the leafy fennel and the fennel root, and then the parsnips, the half long Guernsey and hollow crown. Um, don't you just love these names? Um, so carrots, you know, I, there's a wonderful quote by um, uh, Cezanne that says uh, uh, the day is coming when a, when a single carrot will set off a revolution. And I really feel that we're sort of entering into a food revolution right now because we have such an appreciation for, for the health of our vegetables, not just the beauty and, and not just the fact that there's a vegetable on the plate, but because vegetables really do taste good when you, when you grow your own and when you're really paying attention to what you're growing. Gourds. Um, gourds are one of the largest vegetable families for gardeners. It includes cucumbers, melons, pumpkins, summer and winter squash, um, and most produce long vines that climb vertically on a trellis. And, and, um, and some of the varieties that, that I recommend are the lemon cucumber or the Armenian, which is a wonderful, um, delicious, edible cucumber for salads. And the West Indian jerkin, you've probably seen those. Those are those little ones that they call those little watermelon shaped, um, tiny little pickling type of, of, of um, mel uh, cucumber. Um, and white wonder is a white cucumber that's also used for pickling. And, and melons, Jenny Lynn and Moon and the Stars Again, another typo, I apologize. Crenshaw, um, Rattlesnake Striped, Bradford, Summer Squash, Cristata, Romanesco, Black Beauty, Ron Rondonese, Patty Pan. 
all of these are all wonderful old heirloom varieties, Long Island cheese, the, the red curry, the Hubbard, the delicata. Um, and I want to share with you a photo that Dave sent with, of the Bradford watermelon growing in his garden. It must have been last year. Um, and I love the fact that he shared this with me. And what a beautiful melon that is. I, I, it looks like you probably have to invite the whole neighborhood in to, to help you um, eat it. But what a beautiful melon. Um, the Costata zucchini and the Rondonese zucchini and the heritage shishu plums and the Jimmy Nardello pepper. There's wonderful stories about how this Jimmy Nardello came over with um, Italian immigrants and how um, they would sow seeds into the linings of their, of, of their jackets and the hems of their skirts because they couldn't bring very much with them, but they, they brought wonderful seeds um, so that they still had the flavor of their home country. Um, and pickling, how many of you make bread and butter pickles? It's something I do every year. I just love making pickles and I, I have way more cucumbers. I grow way more cucumbers than I can use for pickles, but but um, remembering how delicious pickles are is enough to, to make me want to start my cucumber plants right away. And and something like this is a um, apple pumpkin soup and how delicious that fall soup tastes on a cold day. The knotweed family, um, buckwheat, rhubarb, and sorrel. And most of us probably wouldn't, um, don't welcome the knotweed into our, our um, gardens. I know it's, it's um, in, in Vermont, it's considered a, a, a weed that, that wild bamboo weed, but, but there are some uh, good benefits. I, I happen to like rhubarb quite a bit and I love rhubarb pie and um, the different varieties that you can grow would be Victoria or Glaskin's Perpetual and sorrel, there's really only one variety. So there's really not a big family, but um, it's still a family that's worth paying attention to. And um, in my book, I have designs and recipes and this is a recipe for a buckwheat crepe with, with applesauce, which is really quite tasty indeed. Um, and the legume family. And if you're just starting off being a seed saver, this is really the best place to start because legumes are so easy to, um, to allow the seed pods to grow into a dried pod and then save the seeds for the following year. And they don't take any special um, treatment, just put them in a jar in a, in a nice dry, um, warm, uh, away from the sun kind of place. And, and in the legume family would be beans and chickpeas and favas and lentils and peanuts and soybeans. Um, um, and they're really one of the oldest cultivated plants um, and they've sustained the world for hundreds of centuries and, and really um, uh, so many varieties of legumes that you can grow and, and we all have our favorites. Um, perhaps it's a fava bean, the broad Windsor or the um, English fava bean or a snap bean, the fin de bagnole, which is a French variety, or the bird de roquin court, or the dragon's tongue, which is this wonderful striped one here in the photo, or the, the, um, the rattlesnake, or the triomfo de violetto is one of my favorite uh, old varieties. It's an Italian uh, variety, which is this one here, and it, it grows as a pole bean, and, and um, it's absolutely delicious, as is the yellow or green annelino. Um, and so there's so many different varieties varieties of, of beans and peas that you can grow. And I, I, I bet we all have our favorite and I hope you share with some of, maybe type them into the chat box, some of your favorite beans and peas so we can discuss some of the old varieties that, that you love to eat and love to save. Um, and beans are so beautiful. I, I remember the first time I started growing them. These are a chocolate runner beans and and they looked kind of nice you know they're pretty little beans but I didn't eat any of them and at the end of the season um, that I opened up the pods and every single pod had a different different size a different color a different uh, marking on the peas on the beans and I just absolutely fell in love with with the idea of saving um, shell beans but of course, I can't eat, I can't save all the beans that I, that I grow. So I do need to, to um, prepare some of them in, in nice recipes. And this is a, a, um, a bean or borlato and farro bean salad, a recipe from the book. 
Um, Green Arrow P. Dave sent me this photo. I think this is these were his peas just last week, and um, and maybe this is what your peas look like um, coming up out of the ground. So I guess you have another few weeks before you can harvest them. But the Green Arrow P is a, a a really nice old variety that that um, grows quite tall and it's delicious um, edible variety of pea. And there, as you probably know, there's there's different kinds of peas. There's sugar snap peas and and the kind that you open the pod and then the the um, the flat peas, which are known as the Chinese peas. And then nightshade family, the eggplant, ground cherry, peppers, potatoes, tomatillos, tom tomatoes. Um, after tasting tomatoes in France, Thomas Jefferson brought seeds to Monticello in 1780 planting a dwarf tomata and a large ribbed Spanish tomata. This curious plant among, along with other members of the Solanchi family was not immediately popular since some members of this family are poisonous. Um, fast forward 200 years and these are the most popular crop in almost every home garden. Um, on the flip side, there are tobacco, detura, mandrake, and belladonna, which are also in the nightshade family, which are the poisonous part of the family. Um, but many of you probably adore your heirloom tomatoes and, and wouldn't give them up for anything. Um, but you might try something like these wonderful ground cherries, which are um, in the, they're, I don't think they're in the tomatillo family, but they do look like a tomatillo. And also in this family are, are potatoes. And, and um, I'm going to start throwing some quotes in here by one of my favorite authors, um, Wendell Berry. Um, Telling a story is like reaching into a granary full of wheat and drawing out a handful. There's always more to tell than can be told. And I feel that way about tomatoes. Each one of these tomatoes can tell a story. This is a, um, a green zebra tomato. Now, how did it get that wonderful name? And some of these wonderful cat facings on these persimmon tomatoes and the purple tomatoes. And, and each one of these tomatoes has a story to tell. And same with peppers. Again, this is another uh, a picture of the Jimmy Nardello pepper and then the Hungarian and red pepper and all of these peppers started in somebody's garden and have been handed down. And heirloom recipes are, are really important and being able to record some of the recipes that our, our ancestors have, have produced. This is a wonderful maple um, salsa that's a, a recipe in my book and it was one that my grandmother made. Um, and potatoes are such an important food crop and we're, we're pretty limited by what we can get in the grocery store. Usually we just get the red Norland or the russet or the, um, uh, or the, what do we have, the, the, well, the yellow, some kind of um, you know, Yukon gold. But if you're growing your own heirloom potatoes, you can grow the Peruvian purple or the French fingerling or, or um, perhaps the Russian banana. And um, you'll be really surprised at the flavor difference between each one. Another example of, of how the Cape gooseberry grows looking like a little, there's a little fruit inside there and that little fruit when it's dry opens up in, in a little papery husk and you get this wonderful little ground husk cherry and this is a recipe from my book, it's a um, Cape gooseberry um, clough fooding. The lily family, asparagus, onions, shallot, walking onions, leeks, chives, I, I start every meal with onions, onions and garlic are the foundation of, of really cooking around the world. I think we all start with onions and we love onions and um, they're called, they're, they're, the family is called the Lileshi family um, that evolved millions of years ago and it's, I never really knew until I was writing this book um, that asparagus and onions were, were related in that way. Um, different asparagus varieties and, and asparagus is one of those crops that I probably would not recommend growing heirloom varieties. I don't think the flavor will make that much difference and there's so many wonderful new varieties that are being bred that um, one of the problems with the older varieties is that, that they were, um, you would get male and female plants and you know the female ones create the berries and, and then the plants aren't good anymore so you have to replace them. But some of the old varieties would be the Martha Washington and the Mary Washington, um, obviously named after um, his, history, historic women. Um, garlic, the porcelain garlic, the German red, the Georgian fire, the Spanish rosia, the Rocambole, the, the Amish Rocambole, the leeks, the blue, blue Solace, the King Richard. If any of you have grown any of these, I'd love to know. Um, I always grow the blue, blue Solace and the King Richard. They're quite different. One is, one is very tall and thin and the other is short and flat. They're really um, wonderful leeks to grow. And then so many different 
different kinds of, of heirloom um, onions to grow. Um, this is a walking onion, one of my favorite ornamental onions. I, I took this, this photo last summer. Um, and I love the walking onion because it's a top setting onion and it walks across the garden. Once the, the, the heads get that tall, they tip over and they start to um, make another garden, but they're absolutely a delicious onion. Last year I pulled them up and ate the roots and then replanted the tops and I'm hoping they come back again. They're a perennial onion. And the sunflower family is probably the largest family. It's, um, it's also known the, as the comp Composite family, um, lettuce, artichoke, calendula, chicory, marigold, salsify, sunflower. Salsify is a vegetable that I've never quite figured out how to prepare, but I, I know it's an old variety that was very popular back in Thomas Jefferson's day. Um, and uh, some of these are, are chicories are, are kind of bitter, whereas lettuce can get bitter if you let it go to seed. Um, and some of the old varieties, would would be the artichoke, the green globe, the violet de Provence, the cardoon, the calendula, chicories, Jerusalem artichokes, lettuce, um, distinguished by butterhead, crisp head, loose leaf, and romaine. Um, there's lots of different varieties that you can be growing and, and really thinking about what type of lettuce you, you want. This is a little gem, which is a, considered a butterhead, and this would be more of a romaine, and it's a thicker, it's a more of a winter density. And a and, um, hundred years ago, when people were saving their seed and really thinking about what they were growing, they would make a distinction not by what type of lettuce, but by if it were a spring lettuce or a summer lettuce or a fall wet lettuce or a winter lettuce, because that way they would they would be able to time the, the sowing of the seeds to match the season. Another wonderful picture that Dave sent me of his black seeded Simpson lettuce, which is a, a loose leaf um, lettuce, which is a very traditional and and uh, very easy to grow and, and delicious lettuce for, for the salad bowl. Um, but one of the things about lettuce is that um, we usually pick it before we let it go to seed. This is a red deer tongue lettuce that's growing in my garden. And um, I, I happen to like this particular variety of lettuce. So I let a few of the heads go to seed and, and they're going to flower and then produce seed heads. And it takes quite a a long season for them to do it, but they will produce um, seed in the first year. And it's a, another one of those crops that's fairly easy to, to grow. It just looks a little weedy in the garden if you want that space for something else. But there's so many different kinds of of salad greens that we can be growing that that were really not um, that are not that accessible. Some of these wonderful mustard greens and this is a I don't know what kind of an this is probably an orac and claytonia and chicory and trout back lettuce. So I encourage you to try some new greens this year. And um, radicchio is a little bit harder to grow. This is the Rosa de Trevant the Rosa de Treviso, um, um, which are wonderful old Italian varieties and often they come up looking like a red romaine and you have to cut them back and then allow the root to to send up another growth and then it will often look more like the chicory that that we think of as chicory and the rose family is the flowering plants responsible for some of our most prized culinary fruits and herbs and ornamental trees and shrubs and we don't really think of the rose family as also including apples some of the most wonderful old heirloom varieties the the Baldwin, the Cortland, the Cox's pit, uh, Orange Pippin, and Pears, Bartlett, Seckle, um, Blake's Pride, Raspberries, Strawberries, the Alpine Strawberries, and the Everbearing Strawberries, um, and some varieties of Elderberry, um, which is one of my favorite fruits in my backyard, and of course the Alpine Strawberry, which is a, a wonderful old-fashioned variety, and um, it's not the same type of strawberry that you would use for making a, a shortcake. You'd probably be using the ever-bearing um, for that. But, but just remembering of how delicious homegrown fruit is, and maybe this will be the year that you plant an apple tree or a fruit a peach tree or um, some wonderful um, kind of fruit that, that you can grow in your own backyard. And then the mint family, mint, basil, lavender, lemon balm, marjoram. These are all seasonings that we use to really enhance 
plants are cooking. And um, I have a separate garden that is just purely an herb garden where I grow a lot of basil to grow, um, to be able to make my pesto swirl bread. Um, and I love making herb cheese bread, which is an old old variety. Uh, I mean, an old recipe that I got also from my grandmother that, that really doesn't, it doesn't matter what kind of herbs you put in there, just a, a half a cup of freshly grown chopped herbs. Um, uh, mixed together with flour and water and cheese and yeast and you have the most delicious fresh home-baked bread. Um, and basil is a huge family and you know, we many of us grow sweet Genovese and opal basil but there's also cinnamon basil and lime basil and lemon basil and all kinds of different kinds of basil that you can grow. Um, a recipe from my book is a chocolate mint granita so so maybe you'd like to just grow a whole mint garden and that would be delicious too. So um, just wrapping it up now, do unto the to those, this is another quote by Wendell Berry, do unto those downstream as you would have those upstream do unto you. Um, and to remember to play with your food in the garden and in the kitchen. Um, and there's really only two things in life that money can't buy, true love and homegrown tomatoes. Um, so I want to say thank you very much. This is the cover of my book um, and you can find it in bookstores everywhere, including my website. And I'm going to stop screen sharing and I hope some of you have typed some chat, some things into the chat so we can talk about the heirlooms that you're growing. Thank you. Great, thank you so much, Ellen. And I, the only one I see here is from Callie, and she said, "Lady peas." Ooh, tell me about lady peas, Callie. Oh uh, well, they're actually we used to call them cross mama peas because we got them from my great grandmother, and you can still oh. find them in some seed catalogs. But they're just a very tiny, very tiny light green pea. They're they're almost not mm. worth peeling because they're so small, but. They're very, very good and you can grow them around here. So did you say you got the seed from your grandmother? We, we used to have them at my grandmother's house. She grew them. Oh, and then, then years cool. later, yeah. my mother tracked down the, the same variety. Oh, good. See, and that's something I didn't really mention in heirlooms. There's so much to talk about with heirlooms and it's very hard for me to just kind of do it in, in this short time frame. But one of the wonderful things about heirlooms is that People name them different things, and they're often named by by about a, from a by a, a. You know what I'm trying to say. <laughs> I'm getting tongue twisted. Either the region that they've been growing in, or the person that um, they gave them to you, or or whatever. And I wanted to just share a few of my favorite books. Um, this is a book by um, Suzanne Ashworth, and I've had this this book for uh, 40 years about seed to seed, and it's all about seed saving. And um, this is a more a newer book, which I also like very much, which is called The Seed Garden. Um, and this is put out by the Seed Savers Exchange and it's it's very accessible and it goes, it talks about the plant families like I talked about tonight, but also much more in depth about how to save seeds and why that's important. Um, and one more book and it's not about seed saving, but um, I do love uh, Monticello and, and the history of Thomas Jefferson's garden. And, and this written this was written by Peter Hatch. It's called A Rich Spot on Earth. And I highly recommend it. It gives a lot of the history of Monticello and and his his diaries and all the different things that he would grow and um, and how he was a fanatic seed saver. Oh, somebody uh, wrote, Mammy Brown Tomato has a cool story behind it. Would um, Beverly, would you care to share that story about it? Well, look at that, Lady Peas sell for $18 a quart. So I guess you have to unmute yourself to share the story. Yes, I, okay, I think I'm unmuted, but I don't have the picture. Perfect. Great, great. But that, that, that's okay. <laughs> yeah, thank you. I, I uh, picked up uh, a Mammy Brown tomato maybe five years ago, and somebody, if this was in Master Gardeners, by the way, the, the man that I got it from, uh, to, told me that it was a story, that it was a tomato that um, had been passed along for many generations from one family to another. And I don't know if you can buy it or not, but I've been saving seed and it is one of the best tasting tomatoes I've ever had. Oh, oh that's a great story. Uh, 
Um, I have a question to ask you. So you say you save the seed of tomato. There's a lot of controversy about how to save tomato seed because I always would let them ferment. Um, do you just like squeeze the seed out? Tell us how you save your seed. Your okay, tomato. I do let it ferment. I let it ferment in water. I put it in a, a um, glass and stir it, uh -huh. and um, the pop will rise. The pulp will, will rise to the top, and you can scoop that off. In about four or five days, you got a ungodly mess there. <laughs> so you need to stir it again uh -huh. and skim off the top and any seeds that are not viable. Now your good seeds are going to sink to the bottom. Mm -hmm. um, so you, you want to throw away any that are small and immature. Mm -hmm. Then what I do is drain it on to a coffee filter that I have in a sieve and spread the coffee filter out and let it dry uh, for several weeks. And then I can cut up this coffee filter and give it to other people mm. uh, in little pieces. And the seeds also come off very easily whenever I want to plant it. Unfortunately, like Dave here, my garden is small and I can only plant a few tomato plants every year. My idea of tomatoes though is to plant two of several different varieties. So I can't plant too many of those, but. Nice, that's wonderful. That's a great tip. I, I'm very impressed, thank you. I'd be willing to share the seed if you put it in the comments. Oh, wow, that sounds great. Yep. Um, put what in the comments? Your name and oh, an address. My address, okay, and, I'll send, I'll send and that. Maybe if a lot of people respond, I'll ask for a self-addressed envelope. But, but if, okay, but I'm if uh, now, I'm 20, I'm, yeah, that's a different story. I'm sending you a note right now in the chat. <laughs> I found this online. It was um, Mammy's brown, pink, brown's pink tomatoes. I wonder if this is the same sort. It looks like it. Interesting. Well, there, there it is. found it online. Boo-hoo. Well, what's it say? Uh, it just says Mamie's it. Brown's Pink Tomato, beefsteak style, sweet, yes. acid flavor balance. Um, so let's see where you where you can even get them. While we're uh talking about uh, tomatoes and other heirlooms. The Bradford watermelon that I grew, uh, if you wanna look up its story, you can go to Southern Living Magazine. It was featured in there. And then also just Google Bradford watermelon and the family's page will come up. And it's a great story. It never made it to market because the skin was so thin. And, uh, but as Ellen mentioned, it cross pollinates so I am going to try to plant them again and just see what happens. But that watermelon I had there, it weighed 34 pounds. Wow. So it's quite large. <laughs> That's big. Yes. That's great. Well, what other questions do we have or ideas? Uh, I do grow Malabar spinach and they do self seed. Uh, so I. I don't go through the painstaking problem of scoring the seed and all that because it, it self seeds better than I do. <laughs> Great. No, I... Any more? I guess we're all getting hungry for dinner. Yes. So the blueberry suggestions, um, I'm not sure if anybody from the community garden is on here or not. Um, I'm a member of the community garden, but I'm not an expert in our blueberries, but I know that we grow high bush, I believe is what it is, blueberries. And uh, so I think the Southern varieties are different than the Northern varieties. Mm -hmm. Rabbit eye is a good blueberry for oh. down here. Okay. 
spoken from the master gardener. So that is a good <laughs> suggestion. Well, great. Well, I see that it's, oh, has anyone tried? Let's make this one the last question. Has anyone tried artichokes? We know that Ellen grows artichokes. Do you have any tricks for us, Ellen, for how to grow a good artichoke? Well, I think they need um, cold, they need, um, you know, when they're, you're putting them out in the garden, they need to be, they need to go down to freezing over a couple nights for the buds to set. That's what I've been told up here. So I don't know if you're gonna get that or not. About every 10 years we can grow artichokes. <laughs> <laughs> well, consider yourself lucky. <laughs> <laughs> Well, I want to thank everybody for uh, joining us and Callie will be sending out an evaluation and it's really important uh, just to give us feedback so we know what programming that we should offer and uh, of course Communiversity, I'll share the results with them as well too, but it's, it's more about your view of the program and it's uh, just to help us with programming. So be expecting the evaluation. And uh, please, uh, Ellen didn't tell me to say this, but please buy her books. I love her books. I have her original book actually sitting on an easel on our counter that my wife just kind of uses decoration. And um, so anyway, they're great books. And then of course, the Southern Living uh, Garden book. If you're new to gardening in the South, I think that will help you to know what to plant when, that's always kind of nice. It doesn't deal just with the heirlooms, but I think that's helpful. Okay, well, let's give Ellen a round of applause and <laughs> thank you so much. Thank you, and nice to meet you. Yes, I appreciate everybody. Thank yeah. you so much and have a good night. Thank yeah. you.